Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Plant Powered Metro New York's live stream series, Nutrition Heroes in Healthcare. I'm Leanna Levine Reisner, the Network Director of Plant Powered Metro New York, which empowers people in and around New York City to live their best and healthiest lives with whole food, plant based nutrition. We are talking to some of the people in your neighborhood this summer who are bringing for food to the forefront in healthcare. Each of our featured guests is deeply knowledgeable about the power of whole plant foods in health and healing. So we're going to explore their journeys, expertise, and pioneering projects that are changing how clinicians approach patient care and the future of healthcare. Later in the hour, I'll be taking questions from the comment feeds on Facebook and YouTube. So please feel free to share your comments and questions as we move along. This week, I am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Michelle McMacken. Dr. McMacken is an associate professor of medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, an honors graduate of Yale University and Columbia University. She practices internal medicine in the adult primary care center at NYC Health and Hospitals Bellevue. She also directs Bellevue's adult weight management program and plant-based lifestyle medicine program. Dr. McMacken serves on the board of directors for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and is committed to teaching and practicing evidence-based lifestyle as medicine. Dr. McMacken, welcome. Thank you so much, Liana. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. I'd love to start at the beginning and just ask what really first led you into the field of medicine, even before you became such a proponent of lifestyle medicine? So that's actually quite a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, so I uh, actually didn't take any science classes in college. I was an English major and had no idea I would ever go into medicine. And then after I finished college, I got a job at the CDC, at the Centers for Disease Control as a writer editor. And it was there that I kind of fell in love with actually the idea of uh, public health and epidemiology and outbreak investigations. Uh, and that's what actually led me to um, go back and take all of my pre-med classes and go to medical school. Once I got to medical school, um, my interest within medicine changed quite a bit. And I decided that uh, what I really loved was communication with patients and getting to know people one on one, um, supporting them, um, being essentially primary care was kind of the field that spoke to me the most. Excellent. So then at what point in your medical school career did you start to learn about whole food, plant based nutrition and lifestyle medicine? very late, as it turns out. Um, I always joke, you know, when I, when I give lectures to um, med students and residents, I, I always joke like, you're so far of the head of, ahead of the game that you're even getting this lecture and your training because I didn't get a lot of nutrition training like most doctors. You know, we learned about things like uh, what happens when you are deficient in certain micronutrients, like you're low in thiamine and you can get these, you know, these unusual um, complications. But we never learned about things like, you know, how do you how do you counsel patients who have diabetes or have high cholesterol? I mean, the most basic things that we all see every single day. Um, so for the first nine or so years of my career as a primary care attending, um, I really didn't know much. And it was not until uh, 2013 when by literally a stroke of complete luck, um, I ended up Googling uh, lifestyle medicine. And it was a term that I didn't really know what it meant. I thought it actually meant that I would have a better lifestyle as a physician <laughs> because I was kind of at that 10 year primary care mark where I was thinking I'm kind of burning out. I'm just filling out a lot of forms, prescribing a lot of pills. It's a big, um, you know, it's, it's just everyone's in and out in 20 minutes. Um, and I went to this conference, uh, which was the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's annual conference. And it was mind blowing, frankly. I, I, um, I'm almost embarrassed to admit that I had no idea how much evidence there is to support um, an optimal diet for health outcomes. I had no idea that what we eat is the biggest behavioral risk factor for um, dying of a chronic disease. Um, I just had no idea of the strength of the evidence. And it was, it was really through that conference that I became awakened. 
That's amazing. And I think it's so you know, true to all of our stories to, to hear yet another person who stumbled upon, stumbled upon. And, and if only we could stop the stumbling and make it more widespread and you know, just known by more people. So that's amazing. So did you actually make changes to your diet and lifestyle at the time that you attended the conference or afterwards? How did that play out for you personally? Well, so I kind of had, um, I, always, I always describe it as sort of two um, separate awakenings. So actually before 2013, some, you know, sometime in the mid O's, um, I recognized that uh, where, you know, where my food was coming from um, was not really aligned with my values. So I recognized that, you know, what happens in factory farms and what happens to uh, many animals to get onto my plate, I realized that was just not really aligned. It was not something I was comfortable with and I decided to go vegan. And uh, that was in 2007. And at that time, um, it was not something that I, sh I certainly didn't really share it with my colleagues. Um, I, you know, I figured this is a very personal decision and um, I'm just gonna do the best I can. I thought it would be very hard to do. And it turned out for me personally, it was, it was not actually that hard. Um, and I was very happy about that decision. Um, but that didn't really mean that I understood the role of nutrition in medicine, in fact, I didn't really see a huge connection there. Um, so it was kind of two, two awakenings um, in series. Understood. And when you ultimately went in that direction, did, um, did your own change and your own awakening, did you bring that back and talk to your colleagues about that back at home? How did it play out? Yeah, so I think, you know, what I learned at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine um, annual event just was really literally planting a seed. I just realized that I had a lot to learn and I had a lot of catching up to do around the nutrition science specifically. And so when I when I came back to work after that conference, I started on my own incorporating nutrition into my practice with the little that I had known and just kind of using the um, sort of the, the what I call the low hanging fruit of nutrition science, which is literally fruit for many people because people love fruit and a lot of people are, you know, have heard that they shouldn't eat fruit. And, and, and so that was great. Um, and then I got a grant through NYU along with one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Sapna Shah. And the two of us used this fellowship grant to actually do a nutrition study program and for two years, research the literature, go to conferences, read books, read papers. And then ultimately we developed a nutrition curriculum to teach our own colleagues about nutrition. And, you know, you never know something as well as when you have to teach it to someone else. So we, we studied hard and we learned a lot. And that's kind of how I got to the, the state of knowledge that I, that I have. That's fantastic. And how did you end up delivering the curriculum? Was it through NYU? Yeah, it was through NYU as a series of lectures uh, for our, for our colleagues um, around you know different um, just general lifestyle medicine and then around um, specifically for cardiovascular risk reduction for diabetes for cancer prevention um, for weight management and then we had a session on counseling and we had a cooking demo and our colleagues got really fired up about it everyone really liked it and it was a novel topic um, unfortunately <laughs> but but it was great that they were so fired up that's great. So let's bring this into your own practice as a physician. Can you explain a little more about your interest in, in weight management and how you got into the adult weight management program at Bellevue? Yeah, so when I started working, when I started working at Bellevue, there was an opening to to direct the the hospital's uh, pre-existing weight management program, and I was really excited about taking that role because um, it was you know, as I mentioned before, I, I really, one of the things I really like the most about medicine is that one-on-one -on -one communication with patients around behavior change. And um, what we, what the model that we've been following in weight management for a long time is around, largely around behavior change, because when it comes to obesity medicine, it's really, you know, a much bigger story, but you know, when it comes to medications and surgery, those are not always accessible to people or or needed. Um, but uh, so most of the focus has really been on behavior changes. So I I spent you know a lot of time one on one with patients um, that way. And when you talk about behavior changes with people, you get to know them in a way that it, it just is not equal as to when you're simply prescribing medications and referring people for screening tests, which is important, but but it, you learn about people's lives in a way that you don't necessarily have an opportunity to do so otherwise. And I really love that. That's amazing. And you had time in the clinical encounter to actually go there? Yes. Yeah, so that was the other piece is that we're, you know, when you focus, when you're, when your role is literally that, and you're, you're taking that, um, you're, you're, you're making that the focus of the visit, it's becomes even more enjoyable because you don't feel so pressed 
to do all of the things in that squashed amount of time that we as primary care doctors have. That's amazing. So what types of patients do you generally see in the weight management program and what goes into the counseling in that kind of situation? Yeah, so we, you know, we see patients, um, most of our patients are um, coming to us uh, from within the Bellevue Hospital system. So they're referred by their physicians um, because their physician sees that the patient could uh, potentially benefit from a weight management approach of, because of the you know, comorbid diseases that the person's living with, like their diabetes or their high blood pressure, their sleep apnea. Um, but our patients come to us typically, uh, honestly, very frustrated and, and um, sometimes stigmatized, unfortunately, um, and feeling bad about themselves. And that's something that I think we have an amazing opportunity to correct in our program, when a patient comes to me and says, you know, there must be something wrong with me, I can't lose weight, or I've tried so hard and I am so frustrated and nothing, it's just, it's been such a sacrifice and yet I'm the same weight or I'm gaining more weight. And I really, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to take the, sort of try my best to t help patients take the blame away from themselves. Um, talk more about, you know, the environment that we live in, the food system they live in, we live in, the biology of obesity, which, you know, is very poorly understood by most people, um, and really approach with compassion. I mean, that's really the, where I lead, um, w w especially, especially in the weight management world, because people are, people just, it's really hard. <laughs> people feel bad. Um, and so I, I never want someone to feel like, if the number on the scale hasn't changed when they come to see me, that they're at fault or it's their fault or they should be ashamed. And so we try very much to take that out of the equation and focus on the behavior changes and things that are much more in a person's control. That's fantastic. And so I'm assuming that you apply a lot of the principles of lifestyle medicine within the weight management program. And that's even separate from what we'll talk about in the plant-based lifestyle medicine program. Yeah, it's a lifestyle, it's a lifestyle medicine program. Uh, we do, we do use medications when appropriate, and we do have patients who are interested in bariatric surgery and who benefit from it. Um, but our job is a job that um, is not really, you know, we don't have the opportunity to offer in primary care very often, which is very detailed lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. Got it. It's very exciting. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, when it comes to the topic of overweight and obesity, you've already mentioned how important it is to show care and to be just thoughtful about the frustrations that people are living with. Um, I would imagine that what you offer is a lot of hope, too. Uh, how does that come out in your, your patient-clinician uh, relationship? Yeah, I think that... Um... I think that when patients, you know, patients come to us a lot of times at the end of their, you know, they feel like they're at their, their end of their rope in terms of the weight loss process. They've tried everything and nothing's going to work and they want a pill or they want a procedure. And um, I don't necessarily, you know, dissuade them from those things, but I do talk to them about how what we, our ethos in this program is about helping them find something that's, um, that, that's not only effective, but actually more importantly, sustainable <laughs> and even more importantly, enjoyable. Um, so that it's not, we're not asking people to follow a temporary diet. We're not asking them to restrict them, res you know, be overly restrictive or restrict themselves. Um, we are asking them to incorporate a lifestyle plan that works with them, with their preferences, with their family, with their culture. Um, so it looks different for different people. And I think pe that message really resonates with people. Um, and they're excited about it. And, um, and then I tell them that I'm, I, you know, there are a range of options for treating obesity for patients that do want to lose weight. And that can include medication therapy, and it can include bariatric surgery. Um, but the foundation is always lifestyle. Fantastic. So let's talk then about the genesis of the plant-based lifestyle medicine program at, at Bellevue. I would love to know, you know, where did this idea come from? Was this something that you knew you wanted to do? Or did somebody else foisted upon you? How did it happen? Yeah, I mean, um, I can't take a ton of the credit for the idea. I will say that I have, um, it was definitely a fantasy of mine, but one that I don't think would ever have come to fruition had it not been for Eric Adams, uh, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who really had a vision around making lifestyle medicine and especially a plant-based lifestyle program accessible to all New Yorkers. And as many people um, know, um, 
Eric Adams has his own um, pretty profound story of uh, health transformation. And he had access to resources that a lot of people don't have access to in terms of that transformation. And so I think he's done an amazing job at sort of paying it back to the community and making this approach accessible to more people and really spreading the word in many, many different ways. So one of his ideas was to use one of the, uh, the city's safety net hospitals. So the city has uh, 11 um, safety net hospitals in its, in its safety net system and Bellevue Hospital is one of them to launch a program um, focusing on a plant-based lifestyle so that literally anyone could come to our program regardless of their health insurance status um, and get support for transitioning to a plant-based lifestyle, um, which, you know, what, what an incredible idea. You know, it's so aligned with, uh, you know, it's so aligned with my own values and my own mission to really democratize these services. And I've, that, this is why I've chosen to work at a place like Bellevue all these years, because I, it's really important to me. Um, and I'm really passionate about serving underserved populations that may not otherwise have access to, to, to great health care. Um, and so then on top of that, to add on my, you know, another passion, which is the plant-based nutrition piece. Um, and, that it was just kind of a, a dream, I you know, to, to know that, that this was um, moving forward. So, uh, so Eric Adams really helped. Um, he helped propel this into being a reality. And Health and Hospitals, uh, to their credit, was has been very, very supportive of our program and um, Bellevue especially. Um, so it's been more than than you know, it's been more than just saying, okay, great, good luck. You know, we'll support you. You know, have a good time. It has been you know, plant-based challenges. Like the other day we got an email at Bellevue, please send in your plant-based, you know, summer recipes and you can win a prize. And I didn't even know who sent it. You know, it's, there's so much excitement and interest in our hospital system, plant-based items on the menu, a meatless Mondays menu. There's so many things going on. So they've supported us um, philosophically um, to an incredible degree. That's really amazing. And am I correct that this is the first clinic of its kind in a public hospital? Yes. And I, I that's to my knowledge, but no one has, I've been saying that for a couple of years and no one has challenged me yet. So I do think it, it's true. That's really amazing. I'm curious about what the relationship is with the hospital administrators who have been behind and supporting uh, the pilot initially. And now I I heard that you have a, yeah. sort of permanent funding, right? It's, it's going to be an ongoing clinic now. Yeah, so it's um, you know we are we started out as a pilot and um, it was you know it was and still is not easy because we're taking um, a very innovative idea and incorporating it in a traditional healthcare setting. So I think in any setting it would been it would have been hard. Um, and then we did that you know really throughout the pandemic, so that added another layer of of curiosity <laughs> um, and complication. Um, but I but I think that you know, as we, after we got through our pilot and we saw some of our results um, and we saw, you know, our hospital system saw how much demand there has been for our program. Uh, we, we, we ultimately generated um, eight, an 850 person waiting list to join our program from, you know, the broader New York city community, which was absolutely amazing. And hospital, the hospital sees that and they can see how much interest there is and how much people want to participate in this program. Um, so we, we ended up um, getting permission to kind of be fully baked into our hospital services. So um, we are not funded per se, like a grant, we accept health insurance and it's a traditional, it's a traditional model in that sense, but we, um, but we, we have, we have sort of job security, which is great. That's fantastic. And you have three other doctors, a dietitian, and a health coach working with you. I, I would love for you to share, you know, what did what made you decide to bring a health coach onto the team? Because that's obviously a different aspect than I think many other clinics offer. Yeah, that's a great question. I uh, So I had this idea, you know, I've been a fan of the coaching process. You know, the concept of being a coach is not unique to a health coach or, or shouldn't be. Um, really across all health professions, I think that we should be familiar with the coaching process because really what it is is just um, allowing the patient to be in the driver's seat and helping support them in what they feel is a good solution for them and the way that the speed at which they want to make a behavior change or any change um, and helping sort of elicit their intrinsic motivation and their intrinsic ideas about how to make those changes. 
So, um, so I definitely think that all, you know, whether you're a physician, a dietitian, a health coach, or another health, you know, in another health discipline, this is a really great skill to have. Um, so I knew that I wanted a health coach who could specifically, you know, harness that that approach and that style to to help our patients not just with the transition to a plant based lifestyle, but also with the transition to healthier sleep habits, to um, better uh, physical activity habits, to stress reduction, to overall well being. And that was that was going to be the person that kind of brought together the recommendations of the physicians and the dietitian um, and helped patients actually. Um, move forward with those changes. But the truth is we all do. We all have the coaching, um, the coaching gene. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're learning about the application of whole food plant-based nutrition in the program, just high level takeaways of what the impact is? Yeah, well, the impact, you know, the impact is uh, we, we, one of the things I always say is that we know, we know so well um, how beneficial a healthy plant-based diet can be from the numerous, you know, the numerous um, um, examples in nutrition science. Um, and in our program, of course, patients that adopt a whole food plant-based diet do extremely well. You know, most of them tend to lose weight if they are carrying excess weight and they want to lose weight. We see improvements in blood sugar. We see improvements in blood pressure. Um, and I think that what I'm, what we're all learning is this is the real world experience of helping people make this transition. So we are seeing patients coming from all walks of life, patients who've never heard of a plant-based diet who are being referred to our program internally through their doctors, patients who have heard of a plant-based diet and are desperate to join our program and want support in doing that. So everybody along the spectrum. And what we're seeing is, as you'd expect, that this transition looks different for everyone. And people make this transition at different rates. They stop at different places along the way. Um, some people stop and say, you know what, this is as far as I'm comfortable going. And our job is to respect and support that. And if they want to make more changes, we're there for them to support them to make more and to, um, you know, and to, to explain to people that typically that, you know, there is a dose dependent effect. So the more you do with lifestyle change, the more benefit you see, particularly if you're living with a chronic disease. Um, but we're there to support people and how far they want to go. And, and, and the, you know, the reality is that it looks really different for different people, depending on their cultural background, their financial background, their family situation, just their personal preferences and their style. Um, and so we're learning how to make this um, accessible and, um, and appealing and enjoyable to a broad range of people and, and relevant, I should say. That's really probably the main thing. Yeah. And it's amazing to me. I mean, you have people self-selecting who are probably a little bit more motivated than others. And I'm curious about what do you, what do, you do with folks who are struggling more, who may be newer to it? Are there certain processes or, or steps that you take them through to help them really incorporate the lifestyle advice that you're offering? Yeah. I mean, I think everybody, everybody, you know, to be successful, everybody to, has to has to have a why. You know, you have to know what is the reason that you want to make lifestyle changes? You know, if you don't have a why, you're probably not going to make changes, um, especially when the going goes rough, you know, and, and things get hard, you're really not going to be able to stick with it. So that's, we're all very big on, like, it's the first question we ask you know, when we meet patients, like, why, why do you want to make changes? Um, and try to dig as deep as we can. So it's not just, oh, I want to get healthy. Okay, but what, what specifically are you bothered by now? And how, what does the future look like? What, what's your vision for how that could look different? Um, and um, so I think the why is a big part. I think um, meeting with people individually is really important. So our, our model from the beginning was to meet only individually with patients. And we realized that we were going to tap out very quickly with our, you know, our access. Um, so we added groups, but the individual piece is really important because people need support and help with the troubleshooting of how to make this work in their own individual lives. Um, and then the group piece is equally important because people also need a lot of social support. You know, they may feel like I'm the only one in my friend group who's doing this. This is kind of weird. And how do I, <laughs> how do I explain this to people? And I need a community, um, which is part of what makes, you know, Plant Powered Metro New York so wonderful because you guys are providing that here in New York City, um, and we're providing that on a micro level within our own program through our group visits and our and our private Facebook page. That's wonderful. Yeah, and you've also been publishing recently with your colleagues at Bellevue, Dr. Joshi and Dr. Shah, and also with Dr. Robert Osfeld at Montefiore Einstein 
Um, and you've been writing uh, about diabetes patients specifically and the role of nutrition in their healing. Can you tell us a little bit about what you have found and, and also why you feel it's so important to publish your findings on diabetes specifically? Do you have two hours? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm obsessed with diabetes. Um, you know, I think that um, one of the things that I find so satisfying about treating type 2 diabetes with lifestyle medicine is that um, when you have a patient who has a new diagnosis, who, you know, they're, they're, they're relatively new in, in, this, in the disease process of developing type 2 diabetes, they stand to benefit so tremendously from a lifestyle change. And you can just see it before your eyes when people make changes. They can see it in their blood sugars if they're checking their blood sugar at home. Um, and, it, and it's so satisfying to see people get healthier through lifestyle change. And again, this does not preclude the use of medications. It's just that lifestyle medicine, as we know, has a very special role that that not all medications can do. So, you know, they can be synergistic. Sometimes people use lifestyle medicine to um, alone when it's appropriate to treat their type 2 diabetes, especially early on. And um, it's just wonderful to see. Um, and the other reason I'm so passionate about treating type 2 diabetes with lifestyle medicine and educating about it is because there's so much darn confusion about food <laughs> for type 2 diabetes. You know, we, you know, it just it just drives me crazy to hear um, you know, let's, let's eliminate carbs. Let's, you know, or, or doctors only talking about sugar. Um, and so I'm really on a mission to talk about a true evidence-based approach for treating type two diabetes. Um, I, I could go on, but, but that's, that's really why I think it's so important to publish on this topic. That's great. So what do you want most for other hospital leaders to know about what you've been pioneering at Bellevue? Well, I think they they should know that there's a huge interest, you know, and 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 let's just talk about the big picture of uh, lifestyle medicine in general. You know, people want help and support in how to change their lifestyle to become healthier. That's the bottom line. I when we started this program, I thought to myself, well, this could be we could crash and burn. I mean, there could be no one interested in this in this at all, and that's obviously was completely the opposite. And people are you know just knocking down the door to get support from a physician, a dietitian, and a health coach in in becoming healthier. So I want hospital administrators, I want hospitals to to see that this is this is desired by people, that this is a service that they can offer that will bring more patients into their fold. Um, so there's potentially, you know, that they can grow their patient population through this. But most importantly, they can help people get healthier. If that's what they're in the business of wanting to do, um, that is, this is a wonderful way to support that. That's great. And I'm curious, uh, in addition to starting a clinic like yours, what else might they do to start including lifestyle medicine in the healthcare environment? I think that you know, there's a lot of ways to change the culture in an institution to support um, a healthy lifestyle and particularly a, a, a more plant-based diet. And um, there's there's so many different options. And I do think that it is important to start to shift the, the institutional culture. So, you know, at our hospital, for example, we started out way back when, when, when Dr. Shaw and I were doing our nutrition um, fellowship training, we started doing staff challenges. And we would do, you know, we did three week challenges and helping, helping our staff just adopt a healthy diet. We did simple lectures. We had um, you know, uh, clinic um, potlucks, everybody brought a plant-based meal, we shared recipes and just got people excited about it. And that was the beginning. Um, and now we have hospital-wide plant-based challenges going on because of the culture has grown. Um, we've done, you know, we've, all of us in the plant-based team have done um, a lot of uh, educational advocacy around plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine. Um, we've done noon webinars for, for the, all hospital employees. Um, and then there's, you know, with the influence of, of Eric Adams, we also got meatless Mondays in the hosp in all of the health and hospital systems. Um, and now we're working towards actually a pilot in our cardiac care unit where our patients will actually get a plant-based diet potentially as their default option, um, which would be really, really cool. So we're, we're working, we're working towards those things. And, um, I do think it's important to change the culture through having people understand the science behind a plant-based diet, particularly, I can just speak for the physicians. Um, we're, you know, and many people want to see the science, but I know most physicians will want to see what the science is. But I do think it's also important to pair that with the taste, you know, to actually bring food to people so they understand you're not just eating salads. This is a diverse and delicious and nourishing and abundant way to eat. 
That's great. And I love for you as an educator, I mean, you, you're an educator in the exam room, but also out in the world and with the medical community. I feel like everywhere I've gone, people have said, oh, yeah, and Dr. McMacken's coming to give grand rounds. Um, it's been so great to have you as as a spokesperson for the field. I'm curious about how your talks have generally been received by your colleagues and also by medical students and is it different uh, depending on sort of the length of time that people have been in the field? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 they tend to, I, I feel that they're received well. Um, I don't know if maybe they're like throwing things behind my back, but I, I feel that, you know, the, 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 the curiosity is there. I think most physicians acknowledge we have not got, really gotten much training and they're grateful um, for the information. Um, I, I just gave a nutrition lecture this morning to uh, residents in training and they were like, why did we never learn this? And how did I never knew how to talk to patients who have high cholesterol and what they should be eating. And, you know, it's just so basic. And so it's so wonderful to just empower people in a short amount of time with the basics. Um, I also like to make it um, accessible to people so that people understand that, you know, you, every little bit does count, even though we know there's a dose dependent effect for people trying to really have a health transformation. Um, they don't necessarily have to feel intimidated by saying everybody, every single person has to go 100% plant based today. You know, it's, it's really a gradual process for most people. It's okay to take small steps. The point is I want I want all of the physicians to understand and support and not certainly not dissuade people from making those changes to understand that this is a healthful way to eat, um, that carbohydrate rich foods can be very good for you, for example. Um, so I think that the, the talks have been well received um, for the most part and, and hopefully have inspired people to, to incorporate this into their own practice. That's wonderful. And when you do get pushback or skepticism, what does it look like? I think the, the most common thing I hear is you know, patients won't change. People don't change. Um, or the time pressure, which is definitely a very valid, that's a really valid, um, you know, issue. Um, but I but I think the, the people don't change comment, I know why people think that, um, because I used to think that. But once you start actually allowing your patients to talk about this and supporting them, I have been shocked at some of the patients who I I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I least would have thought would have made a change come back to me three months later and have, have you know, their diabetes is, you know, they've lost a point off of their hemoglobin A1C because they made the changes that we talked about. Um, again, just selfishly, this is the most rewarding thing I've experienced as a physician. I, I always say that, but it makes me emotional even to talk about it because it's so rewarding. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So tell us about your board certification in lifestyle medicine. Can you explain for the layperson who's watching us, what's the significance of being a diplomate of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine? Yeah, well, that what that really means is that you are, you know, you are trained in the basic evidence-based principles of lifestyle medicine. So um, this is an evidence-based field. This is not, um, this is not, um, a field where we're sort of, you know, going by anecdote or um, what what seems to be right or what's worked for my patients. This is a, a field that's based on clear published science, and it's it's frankly not very out there. I mean, it's actually very basic. <laughs> you know, it's it's a healthy healthy eating, um, getting the right amount of physical activity and the right types of physical activity, reducing stress, getting better sleep, um, building social connections, not you know, not smoking, reducing other substance use. I mean, it's, it's just, it's very basic in terms of principle, um, not so basic in terms of helping people change. Um, so it's, it's that, that diplomat, that degree, um, and that title really means that you understand the evidence base and that you're committing to practicing um, that, incorporating that in your practice. That's great. And you're also now on the board of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Can you share a little bit about what your hopes and dreams are as, as a member of the board of where the future is for the field. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, since the, since that first, you know, weekend where I heard about the American college of lifestyle medicine, um, this is a, this is an organization that has grown tremendously in the past, you know, 10 years. The membership has grown. There's so many more, um, health professionals interested in lifestyle medicine. They're doing a lot of great education and outreach. Um, and I think that, you know, my, the, my mission personally is to, to, to find ways for all physicians to incorporate lifestyle medicine into their practice, whether it's primary care, or cardiology, endocrine. Um, and even though we, some of us are up against uh, more challenges than others, 
because of our time constraints or other issues, just to find a way, even if it doesn't look exactly the same as a full-time lifestyle medicine practice, find a way to incorporate it, whether it's using your resources wisely, refer, using you know, creative referrals, um, partnering with community organizations like yourself um, and, and PPMY. You know, I, I think that, that that really is my mission. That's wonderful. And I'm curious, there's a lot of um, buzz, I would say, around also the field of functional medicine. And one of our, our listeners today sort of popped this into the, the feed. And I'm curious if you could comment on what you understand to be perhaps the differences between a lifestyle medicine approach versus functional medicine. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Dr. Hyman and some other practitioners out there who sort of raised the banner for that field. Yeah. I mean, I think that you know, lifestyle medicine um, distinguishes itself from functional medicine primarily because of the, um, you know, sticking to the um, the larger, more evidence-based data that's out there. Um, you know, I am not an expert in functional medicine, but I know that, you know, there is, there's definitely some overlap. I think that in lifestyle medicine, we are using lifestyle as medicine, but it does not necessarily preclude the use of medications or other things when appropriate. Uh, so um, it just really, the idea is that it's really foundational and it's not about necessarily um, treating, treating say, you know, you have, you have a condition like irritable bowel syndrome and using one particular herb or one particular, um, you know, remedy um, from food to treat that condition. It's more about overall, your overall lifestyle and, and eating pattern um, that, that to prevent and, and treat chronic disease. Great. I'm curious about who, who your heroes are in the field. Who have you learned from or followed in the footsteps of who's been inspiring to you? Well, when people ask me this, the first person who always comes to mind is Brenda Davis. And um, so Brenda is a, uh, she's a, a vegan dietitian um, who's based out of Canada. She's from Canada. And um, one of the things I you know really love about her is that she always she always leads with compassion and she's very, very science-based and she's, I love her non-judgmental approach and she literally knows everything. She, she literally knows everything there is to know about a plant-based diet from the nutrients to the big picture around chronic disease. And so I, I've learned so much from her, both in terms of content and approach over the years. Um, I'm a huge fan. That's wonderful. She's great. So with your busy lifestyle, how do you personally maintain <laughs> a healthy plant-based diet and maybe some of those other pillars of lifestyle medicine in your own life. Listen, I'm not perfect. And I, you know, there's always like, I always say I can't, you know, I don't never have all the balls in the air at the same time. I'm a work in progress, just like everybody else. Um, I think, I think I've got the, the, the plant-based, the healthy plant-based diet pretty much down though, because I've been doing it for a long time. And, and, you know, once you get in, once you get in the groove and you kind of figure out what works for you, you figure out, you know, what are the top 10 or 20, you know, meals that you know how to cook and shop for, and you can always add more, but you just, you kind of get your routine down. And, um, and I really love it. Like I said, I'm, it's aligned with my values on multiple levels. So that part, that part is not too, too hard for me. Um, and I'm also, you know, I also have always loved to to be active and and work out. So that part's pretty good too. I think, you know, I could, I could, and I'm good, and I'm good about sleep. So I think probably what, what's left is the stress reduction piece, and that's something that I'm <laughs> that I'm always working on. Absolutely, and I think in our in our New York lives, <laughs> yeah. stress is it's easy to come by here. Um, I guess I would love to unpack, you know, you've, you've fallen into a groove, you said, in preparing your meals. What, what do you like to eat? What are some go-to meals that you have in, in, your, uh, in your toolkit? So my, um, so I love oatmeal and my, you know, my patients and my colleagues are always laughing because I'm always talking about oatmeal is like, oatmeal is like the core of health, you know, <laughs> it's like accessible, it's cheap, it's culturally relevant for lots of people. Um, so the way I... My breakfast is usually actually, I like my oats cold. So um, especially in the summer. So I'll have, um, I actually have raw oats um, with, with uh, you have frozen berries that I defrost and put in the, the with the oats and some walnuts and a few raisins and then um, unsweetened soy milk. And um, I just don't get sick of it. I personally love, love that breakfast. Um, and then for lunch, I usually have like a bowl type meal. So it's like leafy greens or other veggies with some kind of a legume, either either tofu or um, or beans or chickpeas, um, and then a grain or starchy vegetable. 
So um, that's what kind of keeps me full until um, throughout the afternoon. And then dinner time, um, well, in our house, we love to eat tacos. So we have lentil tacos, black bean tacos, tempeh tacos um, with all different types of toppings. Those are great. Um, we have pasta, like whole grain pastas with chickpeas and, and red sauce. I love that with a side salad. Um, tempeh curries. My husband's a great cook, so he, he loves to make tempeh curries. He makes uh, mujadaro, which is um, which is a dish of brown rice um, with lentils. Um, there's always a green on the plate. But um, sa satisfying and pretty pretty simple stuff. That's great. What are your favorite greens? Greens or grains? Greens. Sorry. Green. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite greens. Um, I like. Well, I I really like um, I really like collards. Mm -hmm. um, I love Swiss chard. Um, I love lacinato kale. Um, I uh, what else? Arugula. I'm a big fan of arugula watercress. I mean, it, you know, you name it. That's great. Do you prepare it in a certain way? Or you like it raw in a salad? What do you prefer? Yeah, both. I mean, I like, I typically like my, I like my greens raw for the, for the most part with collards. I, I do cook them unless I'm using like a collard wrap, the leaf as a wrap. I do tend to cook the collards, cook them, you know, cook them with garlic and, and onion um, with, with rice and beans. Um, but generally I do my leafy greens uh, raw. Nice. So how do you unwind after a long work week or work day? Um, well, I have to say that I have become um, a bit of a homebody through through the pandemic. Have so. we all? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, but I but I actually enjoy. I actually really enjoy. At the end of my day, I look forward to taking a long walk. It sounds so silly, but I I literally crave that that long long walk. And I'll put on a good podcast, and you know I. Sunset is my favorite time of day. So that'll be, you know, a good a good hour, hour and a half walk at the end of the day is a great unwinding for me, especially with music or a podcast. Love it. And any podcasts you're uh, particularly enamored of these days? So um, I listen to um, the Ezra Klein podcast. I like to listen to, there's a great um, nutrition podcast that, um, that I've been listening to and I'll have to get you the name um, I'm blanking on it right now, but I'll get it for your readers, no, for your notes, um, if you want, in a, in a few minutes. Um, I like to listen to This American Life. Um, I like to listen to, to New York Times, like the daily podcast. Um, those are some of my top hits. That's great. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our community? Uh, no, I just thank you so much for the for the chance to 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 be with the community and talk and talk about my story and our and our work at Bellevue. Um, and thank you so much for everything you're doing. Um, I'm really excited to, uh, to to be able to refer our, our patients and others to you. It's amazing what you're doing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. McMacken. You've been such a bright light in the field and somebody who we're so proud to reference as you know showing, demonstrating in real time how a plant-based lifestyle can really be applied to folks who are struggling the most. And we're just tremendously grateful for your leadership in the field. So thank, thank you. you so much. All right. And thank you all for joining us. Please come back next week. We are going to have Dr. Gia Merlot here on Tuesday, August 10th at noon. And she is the clinical professor of nursing and the senior advisor on wellness at New York University as well as clinical professor of psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine. So if you're intrigued about the whole food plant-based movement for health, please check out our website, www.ppmny.org, and you can access our recipe app, PPMNY, in your kitchen. Plant Powered Metro New York is your one-stop shop for information, resources, and action to build healthier plant-powered communities. Hope you have a great day. <music>